Everyone has had a bad day once in their lives. A day where it felt like the world was truly conspiring against you. A day where absolutely everything seemed to go wrong. And even a simple task, such as getting a tank of gas on your way home from work, seems stressful. Sometimes, that bad day turns into a bad week. And sometimes, not very often, it becomes a bad month or even a year. No matter how bad things get, no matter how much stress we are under, or how many things in our lives fall apart, we understand that that is just life. That there isn't someone actually conspiring against us to make our lives harder, to slowly but surely chip away at our success, or our psyche to make us lose it all. And sometimes, things just go as planned. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Today we are going to tackle a story about a woman who, like mentioned, was going through a rough patch. A woman who had built herself a career online, who was passionate about her activism, and who felt like everything she had worked for was slowly, methodically, and incrementally being taken away from her. All written and directed by the powers that be. A woman who had convinced herself that the only way to stand up against the people who were actively trying to suppress her voice was to kill as many of them as possible. Today we are going to be talking about Nassim Ogdam, the woman behind the 2018 shooting at YouTube headquarters. Before we begin, if you like this content, please like this video and hit the subscribe button. Also, feel free to share this video as YouTube actively suppresses true crime content. With that in mind, let us begin. Nassim Ogdam was born April 1979 in Ermia, Iran. Nassim grew up in a loving home with her parents, and while not a lot of reporting has been done on her early life, she herself stated she was deeply cared for by her parents. Her family belonged to the Baha'i faith, which is a relatively new faith that was established in the 19th century in Iran and parts of the Middle East. The religion itself stresses unity amongst people and the planet, outright rejecting racism and nationalism in order to work towards a unified world order that ensures prosperity between all nations, races, creeds, and classes. The religion also believes that all faiths are created equal, as it is believed that all major religions were created to serve the same purpose, that being to honor God and unite people. Members of the faith are prohibited from drinking or selling alcohol, premarital or extramarital sex, and participating in partisan politics, as it is seen as aggressive and divisive. This faith specifically stresses unity between people above all else, and that was something that Nassim took to heart. Because of her faith at the age of seven, Nassim decided she would forego the consumption of any animal products, as she viewed animals virtually the same as people. She felt as if these beliefs of unity amongst men and women should be extended to animals as well, and that any use of animal products was unethical. Not every member of her family had the same feelings as Nassim, and other members continued to eat meat. However, Nassim was steadfast, and outwardly criticized any person she came upon who continued to consume animal products. Despite the fact that the Baha'i faith stresses togetherness and unity, in Iran, it is heavily persecuted, specifically because it is viewed as apostasy from Islam. Over 200 people in Iran were executed for believing in this faith, making the Ogdam's family's continued beliefs and practice incredibly dangerous. Because of the danger that came along with practicing the faith in Iran, the Ogdam family began to consider moving. Nassim's father, Ishmael, began to apply and seek job opportunities overseas. And finally, in 1996, when Nassim was 16 years old, he found one in San Diego, California, with the promise of a new job, as well as the knowledge that they could be free from religious persecution, the family set out to start their lives in the United States. While the majority of the family acclimated to their new surrounding, Nassim did not. In fact, it appeared to those who knew her that she outright rejected the move, choosing to identify as Persian online, and continued to speak primarily in her native language, Farsi. Her parents encouraged her to try and connect with her peers, and to give the culture more of a try. But Nassim was steadfast, choosing to isolate herself from her classmates, never having more than a couple of friends at a time. But what Nassim lacked in personal connections, she more than made up for online. Nassim was incredibly active online from the very beginning on the internet. Her mother stated, Nassim became obsessed with the internet in a near fanatical way, choosing the internet over real life the majority of the time. There was only one thing that Nassim would choose over the internet though, and that was animal rights activism. Over the years, Nassim would only grow more and more fanatical about her veganism and her beliefs that animals should have the same rights as people. She joined the People for Ethical Treatments of Animals, also known as PETA, and began attending the protests. In July of 2009, an article about the Marines' use of pigs in their training 
Wilson was published in various papers at Camp Pendleton in San Diego. This article detailed how the Marines would put pigs under anesthesia, purposely stab and cut them in order to teach their recruits how to treat battlefield wounds and profuse bleeding. The training was also to prepare them for the gore they would likely see on the battlefield in order to lessen the trauma and shock. The article also dictated that after the pigs had been previously wounded and treated, they would immediately be euthanized. After this article was published, PETA organized a protest on August 12th stating that this training was unethical and inhumane. Nassim herself attended this protest, wearing a shirt that she bedazzled to say, Planet Hell pants that she had drawn blood droplets on, and carrying a sword, which she brandished at the military base. The San Diego Union Tribune wrote about this protest and interviewed Nassim as part of their coverage, where she was quoted as saying, For me, animal rights equal human rights. This was far from the only protest that Nassim would attend with PETA. In fact, she became an integral part of the San Diego animal rights scene. However, as the years went on, she slowly stopped attending. Not because her beliefs had waned, if anything, they grew stronger, but she realized that she she could do more for her cause if she focused her attention online. In 2010, about a year after her appearance with a sword at the PETA protest, Nassim joined YouTube under the name Vegan Nassim. Nassim used this YouTube channel to promote her vegan lifestyle, showcase simple vegan recipes, as well as showcase her workout routine, labeling herself as a vegan bodybuilder. These were only a few of her passions as she would also showcase her sewing abilities, wig styling, comedy, hand art, and more. Nassim didn't stop there though. Because she was trilingual and able to speak English, Turkish, and Farsi, she created created three separate YouTube pages to share her comedy and her beliefs. She also created a YouTube hand art channel, a daily motion account, her own Facebook fan page, and two websites, nasimsabz.com and nasimabc.com. While the majority of her content has been taken offline, her Telegram page is still active and showcases some of her work, which is off-putting to say the least with her posting graphic videos of animal abuse and torture in order to further persuade her followers and advocate on behalf of animals. These videos were filled with gore and animal mutilation, but Nassim believed they needed to be shown. In an effort to get more attention on her videos, Nassim also made vegan video parodies of popular songs, like Taylor Swift's Blank Space. This is that parody. Nice to meet you, can I kiss you? I could show you hidden things, pain, sadness, hair, crime, sell your food, oh my brain, look at that meat, it looks like your next heart attack. Life's a game, wanna play, new job, wife, cell phone, this is all you want, ain't it funny, ha 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 I know you hate me, but hey, let's be friends, I can make meat eaters angry in a second. They will tell you I'm insane Cause you know I hate the meat And you hate to change Flower ice cream Hard cookie necklace I could show you hidden things Stolen lives Pretty pigs Eaten heads You're the car baby on your road Find out where you are, takes one month to find yourself, oh no, the world is yet to come. What's this, rat trap? Men screaming, pretending to be lions, chasing hens, killing cows, poaching elephants, there are nightmares everywhere. Don't know when this mad is gonna be over. They only want meat, egg, milk, a skin, even if it's torture. Murder. Don't say I didn't say I didn't want ya. They will tell you I'm insane Cause you know I hate the meat And you better not hate to change
Nassim's content, while off-putting, was ultimately successful. Her Farsi YouTube channel grew to be over 11,000 subscribers, and she had been welcomed into the YouTube Partner Program, which allowed her to place ads on her videos and earn a healthy living. Still though, she lived at home. All of her YouTube channels gave her a combined 20,000 subscribers, and she had over 50,000 followers on Instagram as well. But Nassim's success wasn't only online, as some of her videos on her Turkish YouTube channel were featured on various Turkish television shows, drawing her an even bigger audience. And according to her now defunct website, she also promoted her own channel through various ad spots. Nassim began to describe herself as the most famous Persian animal rights activist online, and she would probably be right. She had garnered quite the audience, and she would have been making a fair amount of money on YouTube. Her content, though at times gory, off-putting, and weird, like this video of her showing how to give a proper breast massage of what appears to be bra inserts, was doing exceptionally well. However, that would not last. Prior to 2016, YouTube was likened to the Wild West. The site had very little moderation, with channels making a living off of edgy comedy, reaction videos that broke copyright law, and videos that showcased graphic content. At the time, it wasn't hard to find inappropriate sexual videos on the site as well, or find someone like Nassim, who would often showcase graphic videos of animal torture. That all changed in 2016, with what is commonly referred to as the adpocalypse. The adpocalypse came in multiple stages, and many believe we are currently in the middle of the fifth adpocalypse right now. The first adpocalypse began August 2016, when YouTube announced that they would be shifting their focus towards more family-friendly content. Content that covered controversial issues began to see a decrease in their views, and videos that included certain search terms were shadow banned from the site, meaning that users wouldn't be able to find the videos organically unless they had a link. Shortly after this change, an article was published accusing the most subscribed YouTuber at the time, PewDiePie, of hate speech. The article caused widespread backlash against YouTube, with people calling for him to be deplatformed. In response, multiple companies like Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, and even the entire UK government stated that they would be pulling their ads from YouTube, which caused creators to see a huge decline in their revenue. Following their departure from the site, Logan Paul uploaded a vlog in which he visited Japan, disrespected the Japanese culture, and in a disgusting display of depravity, showed the body of a dead man that he had stumbled upon in the Aokigahara forest. Once again, multiple advertisers pulled out and stopped paying YouTube to advertise for them, fearing that YouTube would place their ads on videos that they deemed more controversial. YouTube's response to these scandals was swift, and unfortunately, came at the expense of the YouTube creators. Prior to the adpocalypse, and YouTube moving towards favoring family-friendly content, creators were purported to have earned $10 to $20 per 1,000 views, meaning that a video that reached 10,000 views could earn up to $200. Smaller channels were able to earn a good income off of fewer views, and many chose to quit their jobs because of this. However, after the adpocalypse, channels that had been earning $10 per thousand views were now earning $1, and they were seeing their views and subscribers decrease, with their videos being shadow banned and deemed inappropriate in the algorithm. Other channels were noting that their entire back catalog of videos were being labeled as inappropriate and demonetized, meaning that they could no longer make any money on them. Creators who had hundreds of thousands of subscribers and earned upwards of a million views a month had the amount of money they were earning halved and had to scramble to stay advertiser friendly. Commentary channels like Leafy is Here, PewDiePie, and more made videos commenting on how swift and unforgiving the change was. Other creators chose to leave the platform, citing that YouTube refused to help its users utilize the platform. And other creators like Nerd City ended up making videos in which they explained how YouTube's back end actually worked. With channels with millions of subscribers discussing how hard the shift had affected them, it was no surprise that smaller channels like Nassim's were also affected, albeit to a much greater degree. Nassim had gotten used to earning a significant amount of money from her videos. Though she lived at home and didn't seem to have any bills to speak of, she greatly enjoyed the amount of money she earned online and the fame that came with it. So when YouTube labeled her videos as inappropriate and demonetized a hefty amount of her videos, she took that as a personal offense. The videos that we have showcased so far from Nassim have been her more palatable content. However, she was constantly posting videos that featured graphic, violent animal abuse. She would place the words murderer, rape, 
and abuse in her titles. And while some of her content was lighthearted and fun, the vast majority of it didn't fall under YouTube's new guidelines. Nassim felt as if she were being personally victimized by the YouTube system. And instead of trying to work within their new guidelines, Nassim instead protested these measures. On her website, Nassim wrote this, Be aware, dictatorship exists in all countries, but with different tactics. They only care for personal, short-term profits and do anything to reach their goals, even by fooling simple-minded people, hiding the truth, manipulating science, and everything putting public, mental, and physical health at risk, abusing non-human animals, polluting the environment, destroying family values, promoting materialism, sexual degeneration in the name of freedom, and turning people into programmed robots. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Adolf Hitler. There is no free speech in real world and you will be suppressed for telling the truth that is not supported by the system. Videos of targeted users are filtered and merely regulated, so that people can hardly see their videos. There is no equal growth opportunity on YouTube or any other video sharing site. Your channel will grow if they want it to. Nassim also began to complain that YouTube was conspiring with Google to hide her website, and that when you were to Google her name, it would no longer populate her official site the way it used to. She then posted this video, stating that YouTube was discriminating and filtering her content. In February 2017, Nassim traveled to the YouTube headquarters in Silicon Valley and held up a sign, protesting their attack on her channel. The sign read, YouTube Dictatorship. Hidden policy promotes stupidity, discrimination, and suppression of the truth. She then wrote her website name and share if you hate discrimination, hoping people would see her sign and post about her cause. However, the protest attempt died on the spot. Nassim's anger went largely unnoticed, both by the public and by YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube's support system doesn't prioritize smaller creators, and with her channels having less than 100,000 subscribers, she was nowhere near on their radar. But that didn't stop Nassim from feeling personally attacked and discriminated against. Every time she uploaded, her videos were getting struck, entire channels of hers were being demonetized, and on Sunday, March 31st, Nassim had finally had enough. Three days before Nassim would attack YouTube headquarters, Nassim got into a fight with her father. While we don't know what the fight was about, as the family has never spoken about it, but from the way Nassim characterized her dad on her YouTube channel and vilified him for choosing to eat meat, it was more than likely that they argued about that. Nassim had openly railed against YouTube, telling her mother that she hated the company and that they were personally attacking her. She felt as if everything in her life was conspiring against her, and she had had enough. She stormed out of the house and into the night, leaving her her parents' home for the last time. Nassim had done this before a couple of times. In anger over their lifestyle and their choices, she had made it a point to leave. So they presumed that she would be back, and simply needed some time to cool off. It wasn't until no one was able to reach her that they began to worry. After about a day, Nassim's father contacted the police, letting them know that she hadn't been seen in over 24 hours, and they considered her to be a risk to herself and to others. Her father would later go on to say that because of their fight and because of YouTube's continued attack on her channels, he believed that she could be a danger to herself and to others, and she might go to the headquarters to protest. That being said, Nassim didn't have any noted mental health or medical issues that the police were made aware of, which is usually needed to label a missing person at risk. However, Nassim's father told the media that he had indicated that he was worried that she was on her way to the YouTube headquarters, and there was a chance she could cause harm to them, seeing as earlier that year she had purchased a gun. Four days later, at one 1 a.m., the cops found her white Pontiac in a parking lot of a Walmart in Mountain View, only 30 miles away from the YouTube headquarters. After running her car's plates, the cops realized that Nassim was a missing person who could be at risk to herself or others. Because Nassim was a 38-year-old adult woman, she was well within her rights to go missing and leave the family home, meaning the cops had no obligation to bring her back to the home if she said she didn't want to be there. This interrogation was meant to see if she was mentally stable or a risk to her surroundings. It's also incredibly haunting that hours after this interrogation, Nassim would be dead. 5L32, Melvia. 5L32. The plate you just ran comes back associated to a missing person out of San Diego. What's your 20? I'm in the Walmart parking lot. 10, 4. Can you just confirm the plate? It's going to be five zebra Charles X-ray. 
469, throwing a white Pontiac. 10, or A from, so it's going to be a match. It should be a 2006 Pontiac, uh, two-door, and it's associated, uh, stand by one. Stand by, stand by, I have to pull up the mud pit. 32 Mountain View, clear to copy. Go ahead. A missing person is a missing adult at risk, name of Nassim Adam. The Middle Eastern female, 55110, black over black, born in 79. Uh, she usually lives with her grandmother, last seen around noon on the 31st of March, hasn't been heard from since, left in her Pontiac. And four. There is a female sleeping in the back seat of the vehicle right now. Ten. Four. Five L. Correction. B thirty six attached around to this. Hey, Sophia. No, B five L thirty four. Ten seven an occupied vehicle. Oh, I gotta deal. No, B B thirty six. B thirty six. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I missed the reason why she's at risk. Me too, I'm trying to look for it. Stand by. Uh, B36, the category shows at risk, but there's no explanation for that. We're contacting San Diego right now to make sure she's still considered outstanding. Uh, four. Sheriff's missing. This is Christine. Hi, this is uh, the Mountain View Police Department up in Northern California. Uh-huh. Hi, um, we are out with a vehicle that you ha show to be associated to a missing person at risk. Okay. Um, we are just trying to figure out um, what, what was going on with the case that made her at risk. She's like, like oh. a missing adult. Okay, what uh, do you have for the, do you have the FCN by chance? Um, let me see, hold on. Or second. what information do you have for me? Um, I can give you the plate. Okay, let me let me do that. What is the plate? The plate is five zebra Charles X ray four six nine. Actually, I could have given you the name and the date of birth too. Let me see. Let me just do that. That's Pontiac missing person vehicle. There's our case number. Okay, let me wait a minute. One eight one one. Seven two six nine. Now what we have voluntary missing at risk. This is gonna say why they put her at risk on here. Oh yeah, didn't say that either. That's weird. <laughs> Entry. Sometimes they do it just because it, the, there's no prior missing. Okay. But let's see. I didn't say it all on here. So they entered her in at risk because she had no prior missing reports and it was unusual for her to just disappear. Uh, nothing further. There's a 1021 for the father in the hit. Here, the police specify that there was no reason that they were made aware of as to why she would be labeled as at risk. To people who have watched Nassim's content and gone over the things she has said online, it is very clear that there is some amount of mental illness that was being untreated. However, no one in her life could provide a reason as to why she was at risk. So she, as an adult, didn't need to be brought back to her home. Ten four. Kid the the X is going 
going to be 1031A, otherwise invalid. Huh? Yeah, no, but I'm just saying, like, the address might be just, she hasn't been missing before, and right. that was just like... Right, they're probably put, they're doing it at risk. It's just never... So you don't have to worry about 5150. Well, you can just... Okay, you should get that. Phone. Is that probably her? 30? Ah, uh, 20s, maybe? From... What's the year? 79, uh... 30. 30. The scene? Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> hey, that's what happens on this team when there's nah. things going on. Well, I mean, I saw him. I didn't see him. He was here. Oh, there's her heads right here. Hey, police. Hi, are you in a scene? Yeah. Hey, so you reported as missing. Yeah, as missing from San Diego? Yeah, I left my family. Okay. You don't live with them anymore? Okay. Can I, can I just ask if you don't mind why you left? We don't get the line together, so I left them. Okay. Do you have ID on you by chance? So did you just decide to move, or? Were you just not getting along with your family? Yeah, I'm uh, with my brother. With your brother? I know, but he's with my father. With your father. How long have you been here in Mountain View? I left home. Uh, I came here two days ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. I guess you've never done that before, huh? No. Okay, so your family was worried about you. Okay. <clears throat> I guess they called San Diego Police Department and reported you missing. Okay. Oh, you didn't tell your parents or any or family or anything? No. Did you tell anybody where you went? No. Did you tell anybody where you went? No, not yet. Oh, okay. Have they tried calling you? No, I don't have a phone. Oh, you don't have a phone? Or you didn't I, answer? I don't but did they try calling you? My main phone that I used to like to call to them, I left it there. I didn't bring it. Okay. Okay. So they cannot contact me. Oh, okay. Do you have a phone on you at all? Right now, yeah, right now I have a phone. Do you have a phone? Oh, okay. Do you mind if Do you mind if I have it? I won't give it to them. You can probably find it on your phone.
Are you taking any type of medication at all? No. Are you supposed to take medication? No. Okay. okay. You don't want to hurt yourself, do you? Or you don't want to hurt anybody else? You don't want to commit suicide or anything like that, right? Okay. When asked if she was taking any medication, or if she is supposed to take medication, Nassim looks directly at the officer and says no, while shaking her head. She is then immediately asked if she wants to hurt herself or hurt others, at which point she turns her head completely away from the officer and back to the phone in her hand. She shakes her head, but doesn't say no. The complete turn and change from verbal confirmation to timid nonverbal went unnoticed by the police. However, in retrospect, it does indicate that she had already decided what it was that she was going to do. Are you ever planning on going back home? No? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Do you have any friends or anybody out here? No? So where did you go on your from San Diego? It didn't take you a, a month to get here, did it? No. Did it take? It didn't take you a month to get here, did it? No, I left yesterday morning and at night I was here. Oh, okay. So you left yesterday. Oh, just two days ago. Yeah, I, for some reason I thought it was. Oh, you're right. Okay, March 31st. Okay, yeah, you're right. March 31st. Okay. Okay. And then you just drove straight here. Why Mountain View? I mean, I know it's a great city and everything, but. <laughs> but Oh, okay. I wanted to get out of the house already on South San Diego. I have memories. I don't want to have memories. I gotcha. Okay. Something new. Start fresh? Yeah. Okay. I have no memories from past. Ah, very good. Nassim lies about why she chose Mountain View. However, her reasoning as wanting something new is something that plenty of people in between housing would state when talking to the police. So it raised no red flags. California is also an incredibly popular state with people living out of their cars. So no doubt the cops thought nothing of her weak reasoning. Okay, fair enough. What can I find the number? Go into, so... I was just trying to get the password. Oh, you're trying to get your password? Okay. So if you go into your settings, or you're going to your phone, where your phone is at, right? Go all the way back. Go all the way back to your... And go to your phone here. And it should say. Can I see it? Is that okay? Oh, this is a drawer Android, right? So that's why I don't know how to how to work it. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but the, the thing is, is that we sometimes get people that park their stolen vehicles here, and so we run all the plates that are out in the parking lot. And when he ran the plate, it came back to you, but it came back as a missing person. At least in, in an iPhone, it's usually in the phone. <laughs> I might just call my own number, I guess. Because for Android, usually it's within the settings under... Go back. Hit phone. Hit 411 and more. Never mind. Do you have a Siri that helps with... Like a Siri type thing? A Siri type? No. No, no, no. The Android doesn't have Siri, it has but it has Google, Google Assistant? <clears throat> Hold the home button. Hold the home button. What's my phone number? Nah, I don't want to. I just call my work still. That's fine. That'll work. So all we're gonna do, we just had to make sure that you were okay. So we're gonna, we have to call your dad. We're just gonna let him know that you're fine and you wish not to be contacted. And we check your well. Well, we have to tell him, we have to say, we have to tell him that we found you, right? Um, but, I mean, legally we have to do that. We have to say, well, we found her. Um, she is fine. She 
left home because she doesn't want to be there anymore and <clears throat> she doesn't want to be contacted. And that's all we tell them. Okay? And then if you choose to contact your family, you can. But <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll take your name and the, and the car out of the system so you won't be reported missing anymore. Okay? Is there anything you want us to tell your parents? Okay. Okay. Alrighty. <laughs> You're welcome. After Nassim's brief encounter with the police, she seemed to be galvanized in her cause. She had lied to the police when she stated that she didn't want to cause harm to herself or anyone else, as she had spent the prior day at a gun range preparing for what she had planned to do. In the morning, Nassim traveled the 30 miles from Mountain View to San Bruno and parked in a parking structure located across the street from the YouTube headquarters. She then walked onto the campus and found the open outdoor patio, where plenty of workers were sat eating lunch. After a moment, Nassim pulled out the 9mm Smith & Wesson semi-automatic pistol that she had bought mere months before this occasion and opened fire on the crowd. She shot sporadically with no set target and aimed to take down as many people as she could. She first hit two women who had been eating on the patio, ages 32 and 27. She then hit a man, age 36, as he fled the gunfire, hoping to get to safety. Fortunately, she wasn't able to hit anyone else. However, another person fell whilst fleeing and greatly hurt her ankle in the chaos. Almost immediately after Nassim started firing, chaos erupted. People in YouTube's campus had no idea what had occurred and one worker tweeted out we were sitting in a meeting and then we heard people running because it was rumbling the floor. First we thought it was an earthquake. Other employees tweeted while Nassim was shooting, barricading themselves in their offices and sending out a mass goodbye in case something were to happen to them. However, after the initial round of fire, Nassim seemed to realize that she wouldn't be able to do any more damage. Only three people had been hit and already so much of the area had been cleared out. The cops had already been called and she could hear their sirens as it took less than 200 seconds for them to arrive on scene. It was then that Nassim decided to take her own life, placing the gun to her temple and pulling the trigger. Luckily, the only life Nassim was able to take that day was her own. While the two victims had been in critical condition when they arrived at the Zuckerberg Hospital in San Francisco, absolutely everyone who had been injured made a full recovery. However, thousands were affected by this tragedy. Nassim was undoubtedly suffering from some untreated form of mental illness and believed, without evidence, that YouTube and Google were conspiring against her. She believed wholeheartedly that the world at large and the powers that be were conspiring against her as well because of her beliefs and her animal rights activism, and there was nothing anyone could do to convince her otherwise. After the attack, all of her social media platforms were taken offline, save for her Telegram page, where she posted in Farsi. It remains a time capsule and a look inside the mind of someone who planned to take as many innocent lives as she could, all because of a perceived wrong. Thank you for watching this episode of Dreading. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe down below. If you have a case you would like us to cover next, please let us know in the comments. And if you feel so inclined, please share this video. YouTube does suppress true crime content, and any support is welcomed. Have a good night, and stay safe.